Hello and welcome back to my series of videos where I talk about all of the random techie stuff that I own because I still haven't come up with a name for this series yet. And in today's video, I wanted to highlight what are some of my favorite retro PCs, Sony's line of Vio PCs. But before we get to mine, let's talk about some of the history of Sony's Vio division. Sony launched their Vio line of PCs in 1996. Although this wasn't the first time Sony put their name on a line of personal computers, with that credit belonging to the range of MSX-based computers marketed mainly in Japan throughout the 1980s and early 1990s. However, with the launch of Vio, Sony sought to create a line of PCs that were more focused on audio-visual work, as well as portability and trendy modern designs. The first of the Vio desktops were the PCV70 and 90, launched in 1996 with a PCV70 featuring a Pentium 166, 32 megabytes of RAM, a 2 megabyte ATI RAGE 3D graphics card, 8 speed CD-ROM drive, and a 2.1 hard drive with Windows 95. While the PCV90 upped the specs to a 200 megahertz Pentium and a 2.5 gigabyte hard drive. Both machines featured a novel 3D graphical interface designed to make use of a PC easier for new users. The first Vio laptops followed in 1997, with the 505 series and 700 series, with notable models such as the Vio PCG505 Super Slim, with a price tag commanding $2,000 US dollars, roughly $3,640 in 2022. The Super Slim was constructed with a four-panel magnesium body, allowing the laptop to remain rather light. Sony continued to pump out desktops and laptops well into the 2000s making good use of many of Sony's technologies like Memory Stick, iLink, and some computers even came with a mini disk drive. In fact, Sony's Vio range of desktops was so impressive that in 2001, Steve Jobs presented a Vio PC running Mac OS X to Sony executives, with the possibility of a collaboration. However, Sony's Vio team turned down the proposal as they considered it to be a quote, diversion of resources since the Vio line of Windows-based computers was still selling more year after year. And that is where we come to my Vio, a PCV RX 450 from 2001. Part of the PCV RX series of computers that launched in 2001, and being the base model of the initial lineup, the RX 450 features a 1GHz AMD Athlon, 128MB of RAM, which has been upgraded to 512MB on this machine, an SIS 730S integrated graphics chip, which on mine I have replaced with a 64MB NVIDIA GeForce 3 Ti 200, a 40GB hard drive, a 3.5 inch floppy drive, 32 speed CDRW drive, and a 16 speed DVD ROM drive, all packaged together with Windows ME. This machine also features two Sony iLink ports, a 4 pin up front, and a 6 pin around back for connecting a DV or HDV camcorder to the computer for easy digital video transfer. But before we even get to the software side of this machine, I'd like to highlight some of the features of this case that I love. Being a smaller form factor machine, you would expect expansion and maintenance on a machine like this to be difficult. After all, many other PC manufacturers don't generally put much thought into how a customer or repair guy might navigate their rather cramped insides of a smaller form factor tower. In fact, that's been my general experience with smaller towers. They're usually very annoying to work on since you have to navigate the spaghetti mess of wiring and cramped insides of a machine so small, with the power supply and drive caddies taking up considerable room. However, that's not the case with the Vio. Sony put in some incredible thought and engineering into making this machine actually fairly easy to get into and work on. To open the case, simply pull on this tab and the side panel pops off, revealing what at first appears to be a rather cramped looking interior, with the power supply annoyingly blocking a lot of access space on the board. However, simply press this tab and the power supply snaps out of place. Now you actually have room to get your hands in there to work on expansion cards and RAM or whatever you actually have to get your hands in there for. But the modular design does not stop there as the floppy disk drive can also be taken down easily. By simply pressing this tab and sliding it along its rail, it is easily removed. The same can be said for the hard drive caddy. Simply disconnect the drive and pull down this tab and pull the caddy right out. And putting everything back in place is simply the reverse of what you just did. But what about the CD and DVD drives? You may notice that there is a big sort of tunnel up top where you would normally have access to the drive caddy. Well, on top of the case, simply squeeze these two tabs and pull back. 
and the whole top of the case comes off. Then simply pull the caddy back and lift up. This does take some time to figure out. You sort of have to finagle its way out, but it comes out relatively easy. Then all you have to do is disconnect the drive and unscrew it. The only time we've actually had to use a screwdriver so far. This is where I should also mention one of the few problems this design has. These drives are designed to match the front of the case. Rather than being hidden behind drive bay doors, the end of the tray simply has an attachment that aesthetically matches the rest of the computer. This is a problem since the DVD drive in mine currently does not work, and I can't simply replace it with an off-the-shelf one since it will look terrible. I've been on the lookout for a matching VIO DVD drive to replace it with, but haven't had much luck in finding one. The only other option I possibly have is finding their DVD drive with similar dimensions to the one on the computer, since it's far longer than any other drive I have, and simply transplant the tray into a working drive. Towards the mid-2000s, Sony began to shift VIO's focus to more portable and all-in-one base machines, resulting in models like the VIO L-Series and P-Series, and the VIO tower line sort of began to take a back seat in design. And for comparison, here is my 2006 VIO VGC RC320P. This machine is actually my main XP rig, featuring a Pentium D running at 3.2GHz, 2GB of RAM, and NVIDIA GeForce 7600 GT, as well as two 7200RPM 200GB hard drives running in RAID 0, a Blu-ray drive, and Windows XP Professional. But the specs are not what I want to focus on here. Instead, I want to show the difference in design between the two computers. Because when it comes to user friendliness, the newer one pales in comparison. The only clever bit of design this machine holds is a pretty convenient way to install and remove drives. By simply opening the side panel, you have easy access to the drive caddy. However, this machine couldn't be farther from its predecessor if it tried when it comes to swapping disk drives. I unfortunately had the displeasure of enduring this process when I wanted to swap the DVD-ROM drive in the second bay with a LightScribe drive I had laying around. First, you have to remove the hard drive bay cover, then unscrew and remove the right side panel. Then, you have to unclip three clips holding on this part of the faceplate and swing that off the computer. Then, you have to pop out yet more tabs to remove this entire front panel. Now that you have finally gotten access to the drive bay, you'll then have to deal with the rat's nest of wires in that small, crowded cubby up top, then unscrew the drive and slide it out. And of course, reinstalling the drive is the reverse of all that. But let's get back on track here and talk about the software side of the RX 450. This VIO still has its factory install of Windows ME and includes all of its pre-bundled software. One thing to note is that it's actually pretty light on bloatware. Most of everything that's included on this machine actually has some kind of useful purpose. Some of the pre-bundled software includes Photoshop Elements, Netscape 6.0, Norton Antivirus, Tomb Raider Chronicles, AdaptDeck Direct CD and Easy CD Creator, a CD authoring software, Media Bar, a DVD player suite, OpenMG Jukebox, a Sony music player and manager with CD recording capability, DVGate, a program used for importing video from DV, MicroMV, and HDV Handycams using the Sony iLink port. Unfortunately, my DV camcorder decided to quit on me right as I started making this video, so I am unable to demonstrate this feature. Picture Gear, a picture manager and simple editor, Visual Flow 2.0, a visual photo manager, and Corel Word Perfect 9. Higher end models in the range also featured Adobe Premiere LE, Sonic Foundry SoundForge XP, and Word 2002 in place of Word Perfect 9. 
This machine also features a handy tour guide for the features of the RX series models, which can either be started by clicking the icon or simply by waiting for the default screensaver to start. Other than its pack-in programs, this vial also features a pretty neat desktop wallpaper program that seems to change the background at set intervals. I have never been sure what the set time is, and I've never been able to find any settings for the program either, but it does seem to do something. But since we're on the topic of software, we might as well talk drivers, since there's a little bit of an issue with those as well. As the 2000s continued, sales of new PCs began to slump, and Sony began to feel the struggle with the Vio brand. After years of declining sales, Sony announced on the 4th of February 2014 that it was planning to sell its Vio computer division, and in March of that same year, Japan industrial partners purchased a 95% stake in Vio, with the sale being closed on the 1st of July 2014. Following the sale of Vio, Sony basically dropped all software support for older legacy Vio machines from their website, meaning finding drivers and software for these machines has become extremely difficult, if not impossible sometimes. With a perfect example being the onboard audio chip on my XP Vio. It's not anything special, just a Sigmatel integrated audio chip, the same found in many Dells and HPs, however I probably spent a collective two to three days worth of time trying dozens and dozens of drivers to no avail with this machine. Even finding drivers with matching hardware IDs does not work on this machine. It demands the Sony driver, which as far as I can tell, is no longer in circulation on the internet, and Sony restoration discs are seemingly even rare. eBay returns an incredibly disappointing search result, and they are no longer available through any official source. To this day, I have not been able to find the correct driver for my Vio, instead resorting to installing a Sound Blaster card in its place. And for reasons like that, the fact that this Vio still has its original install of Windows on it is a big deal because while finding drivers and restore discs for this era of Vio is not as hard as later ones, but definitely still somewhat difficult, it's still really cool to me that this machine is still rocking its factory install. Unfortunately, since the sale of Vio in 2014, the Vio brand has sort of faded into obscurity. Though the brand does still exist, they no longer have anywhere near the same influence or notoriety they once held. Like, when in the late 2000s you could always tell you were watching a Sony movie by the amount of Vio product placement present? I'm not even sure if they're still sold in retail stores. At least here in Canada, I have not seen any at any major retailers. But for a while, Vio was sort of the PC market's main competitor to Apple's Macintosh line of computers. They were a premium priced, stylish, multimedia focused machine. In fact, they were leagues ahead of Apple in terms of trendy modern style. At the time of the Vio brand's launch in 1996, a typical Macintosh looked like this. We were still a few years away from the iMac G3's launch, and also a little under a year away from the launch of the 20th anniversary Mac. And that is why Vios are some of my favorite retro PCs. What is it about Sony? A difference in quality you can see? The leading edge of innovation? Reliability you can count on? Performance that captivates you? The Vio PC from Sony. It has all the best of what Sony has to offer.